Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we explore how news organizations are covering the stories of this moment, including COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement, the president's, the election, and many others. My guest is Dr. Anita Varma, Assistant Director of Journalism and Media Ethics at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. Dr. Varma specializes in humanization and news, as well as applying ethics in the practice of journalism and media industries. We discuss how word choice and passive voice can infuse bias into coverage, as well as the pros and cons of humanizing, and the importance of expanding our perspectives and seeking to answer the why. This is part two of my interview with Dr. Varma. You can hear part one at newsincontext.net. Welcome, Dr. Varma. Our choice of sources, that can contain bias, one, of just ease, and two, because I'm not aware, right? The other element to this or aspect to language is the idea of framing, um, how we frame something. Um, If I'm talking about people walking around protesting an event, I can use the word protest. I could use the word demonstration. I could use the word unrest. I could use the word riot. And we know that each of those words carries with it a dog whistle to a different group, right? And and it has a different sort of connotation. The idea of how we frame the stories is one that I have a deep interest in. And I think it, it gets to, again, being aware as journalists and as consumers of news about about how we're receiving information and what that triggers in us. Questions of word choice are, I think, coming up more and more, um, you know, also the question of passive voice. So is it that a car rammed into a protester? Well, cars presumably don't ram themselves in. Um, So who's doing what, right? Those are the basic questions of journalism. And yet in certain highly politicized environments, journalists sometimes seem to, and I shouldn't just put it on journalists, right? We both know that there's a lot of folks who are copy editing, who are generally editing, um, that may change journalist language, but I'll say the news language that we get sometimes seems very direct and in other situations seems very tongue-tied. And it's the cases that things start to seem kind of tongue-tied that, as you said, I think there's a desire to avoid a, a whistle to any group. And yet that in itself can be a whistle to some group. And so given that it's unavoidable that language carries meaning and carries meaning beyond the literal denotation, um, sometimes my students will send me a dictionary definition and I'll say, well, this is what I meant. And I'll say, that's great, but that's not all that it means in this context, even if yes, dictionaries on your side, but we have all of these other levers and discourse that are going on here. And so, how do journalists make those decisions? Well, first it comes to recognizing that there's a decision that you have to make, right? Trying to not make a decision ends up being a decision in itself to not make the decision. Um, And that can lead to some puppeteering by other interests. Uh, But once you've come to terms with the fact that you have to make a choice, you have to make a call here, Uh, I think that the best approach that I've seen some of the most celebrated journalists do is to emphasize the account of the people who are living the experience that you're trying to represent. So this came up quite a bit in Me Too coverage when that first became a really big um, media story. And it was, well, do we say that it was the victim claiming or the survivor claiming that there was unwanted advances? Or do we say that this person was sexually harassed in the workplace? I think the answer has to be the latter, not to say that the media become you know, the public court for convictions to come down without ever seeing you know, more details that may not be immediately available, but instead to say whose story is being told here. And it's also perfectly possible at different points in a story to tell different aspects of the story, right? Different dimensions can come up in different points. Um, So I never want to suggest that we we narrowly focus over here instead of narrowly focusing over here, because I think that's kind of a lateral move. But how can we make journalism more inclusive? That can often start with using the language from 
the people you're talking to and the people that have lived it. So frankly, I'm an academic by training and the language that I use to describe journalism may not be the language that journalists use to describe what they're actually doing. And I think there's value. I hope there's value in the language that I use, but I think there's also value in, you know, hearing directly from journalists what it is they are trying to articulate um, to have that also be part of the story if the story is about journalistic practice, for example. I agree. I think um, I certainly don't want to go around making claims as a journalist. But if I interview somebody and they say something, then my gosh, yes, let's use that quote. I can write to it. I can allow that person to have their voice. And then I can continue with the story. And I, I, I think the idea, though it's funny, the word claim I shy away from that word as a journalist and as a journalism professor. I tell my students not to use it, but it does come up in issues of accusation, right? As so-and-so claims this happened, so-and-so claims. And it's amazing to me how it seeps its way in. And to me, it comes from sort of an official, again, that official bias, because sometimes these accusations are made against someone who's got the backing of the establishment or the backing of an official source. And so we're getting a news release, say, from a police, I call it cop speak, but we're getting the news release from the police department or the fire department or wherever, or the school. And it's phrased in such a way to be very careful. And we're pulling from that news release. And therefore, it seeps into our language as, as journalists. And that voice of the person who was affected or the person who's trying to share their story or push back against whatever story we're getting from the official source is somehow a little bit minimized. And, and it, began, it, comes, it goes back to that, to me, that official source bias. So I really love what you're saying about making sure we're cognizant and intentional about telling the story of the person who's going through the experience. Uh, because I think you're right, that can take us down the road in covering this well. And also, um, uh, you made the other point about stories evolve, different aspects come out. You're not necessarily just on one person's side, you're telling different aspects of the story as they unfold. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a really important aspect of thinking about, you know, who gets to be a truth teller and who get who sort of relegated to making claims. So if it's someone from the mayor's office, does that mean that they told you what happened, that that gets taken as fact? And if it's someone who experienced the policy of the mayor's office, for example, are they making claims? Well, if that's the case, then there's a there's a disparity there in terms of who's getting privileged and who's not. Um, this came up particularly in the case of the situation in Myanmar, as well as Thailand around human trafficking and genocide, um, where officials were outright denying that any of this was going on. And some of the early reporters with Reuters, they actually went into the jungle, they got on bikes and they rode into the jungle. And the claim had been that there was no detention camp in the middle of this jungle in Southeast Asia. And sure enough, the Reuters reporters came upon it. They took pictures of it. They came back to the officials and said, well, then what's this? And I think those kinds of moments are what we, are what we always have to keep in mind that, you know, it was definitely in those officials' interest to claim that that camp just didn't exist. And it's also, I think, an obligation of journalists to look and see, does it exist? And when it does, you know, the stories of the people who were held there and were certainly not given basic rights to to exist as you know flourishing humans should um how do we tell those stories if we stop at the level of the official said it's not there so it must not be there but it's such an egregious thing to claim that this many people don't exist like how can you how can you claim that it turns out they didn't have a lot of trouble claiming it but then how can journalists push beyond that Right. And that is the one of the quintessential elements of journalism or of it. It's a, uh, one of the quintessential roles of a journalist to me is to you don't stop there. You go and you do the rest of the work. You do the news gathering. You push through whether we're covering Myanmar, whether we're covering our local community or our own federal government. I think there are a lot of impo it's important for us to um, tell the full story rather than just the official sources on the level of uh, gaining access to those sources that may not have official titles, you know, it can be understandably difficult starting out. Um, but the other aspect of it is that 
you know, the same routines that apply, let's say you move to a new place and you're a reporter, you're trying to cover uh, the South Bay, which is where I live, and you're not sure who is actually in the know right now, right? With coronavirus, especially, is it the mayor? Is it the governor? Is it the county of public health and so forth? You would likely spend some time looking at past coverage and also calling around, um, trying to get understanding of who the decision makers are at given meetings, um, and who are the opinion leaders that people seem to be really paying attention to either on social media or through letters to the editor. There's often references there. So doing some, some sleuthing on that level to find certain leads. And then as soon as you find a community member, the goal would be to say, this has been great. Can you tell me other folks who you think I should talk to that are also not in boards and not necessarily in elected positions? Because we've got those covered, right? Those we can find. Um, but who are other folks whose stories are not being told? Um, so in research, we call that snowball sampling, right? And you know, by reference that you would be able to say, okay, this person sent me here, sent me here, sent me here. And it's sometimes criticized for not being systematic enough. I always reply to that and say that there's nothing systematic about exclusively quoting the mayor over and over again. So yes, it's always an imperfect science, um, but so is every single method you can imagine. So I think that would be my main suggestion. I think there's additional trepidation sometimes among younger journalists because there's a feeling that if this person's in an official capacity they presumably have some obligation to talk to me as a reporter but if this person is just going about their day maybe there's no obligation but I think that's what reinforces this cycle of only talking about communities instead of talking with them because the assumption is that well, they won't talk to me anyway. And some of them won't, certainly. Um, but those that will can really enrich and, and reframe the story. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. One thing that I teach in my journalism classes is the idea is that very idea, like you have to ask. So many people actually want to tell their stories. I usually introduce this concept in the framing of a tragedy. You know, if you have to get on the scene of a tragedy and you have to talk to a grieving mom or fa father or someone that feels like an awful ask like that feel you know especially your first time but mo more times than not they want to remember their loved one they want to share their stories they want to connect they want everyone to know how amazing this person was they they want people to know that what they feel happened was unjust you know whatever the motive people are likely to talk to you and and as you say you might get a no you might get a hell no, you know, but, but, you know, you just have to kind of persevere and be kind. But you're right. It's like, we're so afraid of that. When really we have to, one, st accept, we're going to get some no's. But two, understand that there are people who want, who've been waiting to tell their story and to be heard. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking with Dr. Anita Varma, Assistant Director of Journalism and Media Ethics at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. On humanization, and we've been talking about that a little bit, making sure we um, allow people to share their own stories. Do you see any pitfalls to humanization uh, in 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 journalism? Oh, I see a lot of pitfalls to humanization, um, which is funny because my research is all about humanizing techniques. So a little bit of background, um, in journalism studies, there's extensive and amazing work about all the ways that journalists may intentionally and inadvertently dehumanize marginalized communities. Um, what I've seen is comparatively less about what happens when journalists humanize marginalized communities. And in the context of marginalized communities, I think there's a lot to be argued in favor of humanizing marginalized communities as much as possible, um, in large measure because the basic assumption of human dignity is often unfortunately not applied to marginalized communities in public discourse in the US, um, whether that's in a news capacity or in other public discourses that are happening right now. So I think that there's definitely a lot of upside for journalists to humanize marginalized communities. Um, that said, there's a potential pitfall in uh, aiming to humanize communities 
that responds to certain stigmas that privileged groups have put on them, right? So that's where we get into like model minority stuff. So you may think that everyone in this community is lazy and a layabout and just lives off of public funds, but I'm here to tell you that Susie Smith is not like that. And that can be quite patronizing. It can be I would argue as problematic as just reporting stories out of that community that fit this cookie cutter of a lazy, lackadaisical um, group of people, which of course no group of people can be, you know, simply categorized as such, particularly not marginalized communities in this country. But I think that that's one potential pitfall of kind of the, here's the exemplar, here's the best one of the lot. She's so good, you wouldn't even know she's of a marginalized community. And that's where the reporter's lens is sort of betrayed there as trying to kind of assimilate this community into, right, the mainstream, trying to assimilate them into being more like, quote unquote, us, when us is assumed to be this dominant group. Um, so that's one potential pitfall. The other potential pitfall is one that kind of keeps me up at night. And this was a New York Times profile that was written of Assad. So Assad that summer had been accused of uh, gassing his own people and uh, the conditions in Syria were becoming worse and worse under his control. Um, the New York Times published a beautiful, beautiful profile of him that emphasized how he thinks about Syria, how charming and approachable and kind he is, and uh, president of Syria, uh, Assad. And this was, I want to say 2015. Um, and it was really a, a humanizing profile of Assad, but those exact same techniques that can be used to humanize people who we think of as the other were now being used to humanize someone who mounting evidence has shown that the number of deaths in Syria, um, his hands are not clean of that. And so I think the downside there is that there's not a, a clear playbook for journalists to use. Um, I would say that when you're out to humanize the top elected or the top appointed, however people become officials in different um, settings, but when you're out to humanize the people who have the most power, that's where things can become kind of problematic. And when you're out to humanize people to make them seem more like us, and again, presuming us is a homogenous mainstream dominant, um, those are two downsides to humanizing. The, the major upside of humanizing is when uh, journalists do this work of humanizing with what I call a solidarity approach. So that's where they would humanize by emphasizing not similarities and not by emphasizing this model minority uh, discourse, but instead by emphasizing people's perspectives. So by showing solidarity, not by taking a side necessarily, but by through the act of including the perspectives of people who are experiencing social injustice. And that kind of humanizing, I've yet to see a downside to. And so in that case, humanization involves a lot of humility on the part of, you know, I'll include myself, the mainstream uh, perspective is to, you know, sit back and, and recognize and accept and really drive home that I... I'm not, it doesn't have to be like me to be all right, or it doesn't have to be like the mainstream to be all right. I need to make sure I'm fully telling the full story to open all of our eyes, if possible, to what else is out there and make sure people who don't usually get their voice heard, get their voice heard. That's really crucial. And I think really well put. And I'll just add on to that, um, coming back to that issue we've been touching on here and there, which is the, the discussions around policing in this country. And so for folks who are fortunate to live in upper middle class and upper class neighborhoods um, that are predominantly white or predominantly non-black, uh, they often have responded um, to these proposals to abolish police or defund police with this fear of, well, how, how would I stay safe without my local police? And I think that those kinds of moments are when you know, journalists who are covering that viewpoint on police um, need to take into account that these folks, there may be, um, there may be numerically more um, who are living in those communities if they're able to, but when you go into communities that live in a culture of fear, as soon as they see a police officer, we have to recognize that for many journalists who are covering this story, they don't feel fear 
or they haven't felt fear maybe before the most recent protests when they see a police officer. Um, and that may not be something that can be assimilated into a mainstream experience, right? Um, because part of being mainstream dominant is that there's privileges attached where you may not have to fear anyone unless there's a particular circumstance to feel afraid. And so being able to represent those kinds of systemic issues um, it's going to be really hard if you're looking for, you know, the token or for someone who's like you, if you're coming at it. And the journalists themselves, you know, making 33K may not be particularly privileged, but coming from institutions of privilege, such as newsrooms, um, that are often viewed as having this, this view from, from nowhere or from somewhere, which is more aligned with a dominant mainstream. Um, that's where some of the struggle and the disconnect can start. And that's why it's been so great to see uh, increased conversation among journalists and among people working in journalism to try to figure out, you know, what is the disconnect happening here and how can we do better? Yeah, I love what you said. Coming from nowhere is coming from somewhere. It's just coming from that easy, dominant mainstream space. Yes. And and you're right. Like when you walk into a community and you don't understand the conditions of that community, you're going to look for an explanation from your perspective or your bank of knowledge when you, there might be a perspective, as we know, living in fear because um, they don't feel they're treated fairly rather than living fear because I did something. The other element that can lead to some misattribution of what's going on when we enter an unfamiliar space um, are around the limits of empathy. So when we empathize and we see, let's say, children suffering, uh, we can feel very much for them. And then after a while, there can be a stark drop off. And one reason for that is that empathy is fatiguing. And so we try to reconcile it to say, well, if we walk around thinking the world must be a fair place, and how could this fit into fairness? Well, I'm going to say their parents probably didn't work hard enough, or I'm going to say that they just aren't doing all their schoolwork. And that kind of victim blaming can also come up as an attempt to reconcile, right, if you view the world as a fair place or um, one of you the world as a fair place, then it can be very hard to come to terms with the idea that there's, there's entrenched and institutionalized unfairness all around us. Um, so I think that's the other psychology element here that, again, makes it really hard when journalists are covering things across those fault lines, but all the more important, right? Because without journalists, people will process things as we see on social media based on their own base instincts and not have this this mediation to understand more. You had written an interesting article about being a part of that was uh, trying not to construe everyone engaged in a specific behavior as having the same motive. And I really was fascinated by that because I think we do that when someone doesn't agree with us or is doing something, we look for sort of a categorization. Oh, you must be this. And therefore we don't agree. And you're doing this on purpose or whatever. And I think we're, we're in such a space right now. And, and the, the, pandemic and the responses to it have been very enlightening for me because wearing a mask is not a political statement. I mean, just flat out isn't. That's just a, to me, a very explicit example. But I think, you know, so much is, oh, well, if you're trying to cover this, you must be partisan or you must be this or you must be my enemy. And I think our, our discourse has gone down that road more and more and more. So I'm wondering how you might recommend to young journalists or young media uh, thinkers how to deal with content creation and covering stories or talking about them in this era of partisan straw men or of of uh, of of what we're what we're facing right now. That's a tough one. And the first thing I would say is that journalists have a fantastic, fantastic challenge and opportunity to lift out of kind of the muck of partisan. Uh, well, hyper-partisanship, I would say that many people who have been involved in party politics for decades don't recognize their parties as they're discussed now, right? There's been something kind of mutated in a lot of discourse that gets so hyper-partisan. Um, but journalists have an, op an opportunity, and I think it's a, it's a short window of opportunity that they get as they're writing stories to try to lift up and out of that and say, okay, what would serve the public interest? right now. And that's not to be confused with what the public finds interesting, because the public may not find anything in particular interesting about, let's say, East Palo Alto. Um, but it is in the public interest for journalists covering the South Bay to recognize that 
part of the area that they're covering and trying to serve includes East Palo Alto. So on that level, it's a lifting out of these partisan interests to think about the public interest, but not to get preoccupied or, you know, kind of veer too far in the direction of trying to cater to audience interests, um, in part because audiences are often interested in what they know they're interested in. But until quite recently, many members of audiences were not particularly aware of the longstanding issues with police brutality, for instance. And now most news outlets would be quite silly not to be covering those issues, right? But the question is, you know, was that ever an issue that shouldn't have been receiving coverage? I would argue it always needed to be receiving coverage. Um, and has been unfortunately overlooked for quite some time in some news outlets. So really trying to lift out of ignoring the partisanship, ignoring the politicization question, um, which is a luxury that journalists working for nonpartisan organizations have, um, and capitalizing on that to say, okay, what is the story and whose lived experiences am I trying to represent now? Um, so there's a lot to be concerned about with coronavirus, but I think that journalists are operating under such constraints with fewer and fewer resources, um, more and more unsympathetic public discourse about them, that this preoccupation with how, are, how is the partisanship piece gonna play, I don't think it can be part of the equation because it leads to a standstill, right? How do you cover anything when it's all gonna end up being and whatever you say, right, go left and it becomes partisan this way, go right and it becomes partisan that way. Um, so given that it's unavoidable, again, I come back to really needing to represent what are people going through and what are the gaps to get us where we need to be? I mean, coronavirus is a great example where we are all living a very interrelated uh, fate and so needing to understand, okay, here's where we are with cases right now. And if what we need is everybody to mask up in order to be able to get back to life as we knew it, um, then what are the stories we need to understand from that? Maybe that's a story about how masks help. Maybe that's a story about, you know, what impact they may have and why you would be wearing one, someone else may not, how to get masks. Um, all of those questions are different than getting in the muck of, are masks infringing on my freedom? Because to consider that a newsworthy claim, journalists have kind of given away, it's sort of like covering trending topics on Twitter, right? If you're just covering trending topics on Twitter, then why do I need a journalist? I can just see the trending topics on Twitter. So I think the unique opportunity journalists have is to, to lift out and think about the public interest, um, which you know has never been more important than in a pandemic. Yes. Is there anything you wanted to say that I didn't ask you about or that you thought was important for people to know? The main question that I ask a lot of the time is why did this happen? And I tend not to get much explanation of it. So I spent a lot of the morning today reading with a lot of distress about uh, all of the shootings that happened in Chicago over the weekend, the history of shootings in Chicago, um, particularly last summer and the summer before they received a lot of coverage, the children who end up shot and injured and in some cases killed. Um, and it's devastating and I feel terrible looking away from it. But what I didn't have by the end of spending quite a lot of time with that coverage was an understanding of why this violence is happening and who is responsible um, and why it's been happening for so long. And of course, Chicago is not the only city affected by severe gun violence. Um, Detroit, New Orleans, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from. Um, and so it's clearly not an isolated issue. And yet after a solid 90 minutes of trying to find an explanation um, in news outlets, I, I really couldn't. And so I turned to more scholarly sources. They also didn't really have any consensus, but it seems quite shocking to me that there be this much coverage and not an answer to that why question, which I think often gets lost. Um, and that's the part where I think journalists can really serve a need that is not necessarily filled right now. Yeah, and that gets to the point of the why is giving the context, it's explaining. And you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it, if we can't figure out the why, then we're never going to be able to solve our problems. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Thank you to Dr. Anita Varma, Assistant Director of Journalism and Media Ethics at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. 
This was part two of our conversation. You can hear part one at newsincontext.net. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing News in Context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on your favorite podcast channel. We're also on Twitter at News in Context SF, and you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.